Is that all the same thing? No. Let's, let's start one in okay. the other direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce my friend Sarah Gorham. Mm -hmm. Friends for a long time. Yes, 22 years. Um, yeah, you see, I can do it. Um, uh, Sarah is the co-founder and publisher of Sarah Van Books, one of our finest literary presses in this country. Uh, she is also a poet, as you will uh, discover more about this afternoon, and an essayist and other stuff. But she is here today to talk to us about her press, and by doing so, also to talk about uh, literary production and distribution in the U.S. Well, hi everyone. Hello. Um, Hello. Um, always pleased to do this. Always happy to meet you all. Um, and you, can we run around and I get your names and I will instantly forget them, but please don't have Do you have your cards? Yeah. Please put them out. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Sabino? Yes. Yeah. You know that my nickname as a grandmother is Sabi? Oh, that's it. <laughs> 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 uh, Jewelry from Ukraine. Irina from Belarus. Maria from Slovakia. Rafa from Pakistan. Sonia from El Salvador. Fena from Algeria. Sindhu from Cote d'Ivoire. Singe from Mongolia. <coughs> Sanjay from India. Wang Zhongchang from China. I think he should have done it. Bayu from Cameroon. Russia from Yemen. And Kerry from Tunisia. <coughs> <laughs> we did not assign seats by gender. They just did that. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that we can paste it. Well, you're the, you're the peninsula here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm here to talk about Sarah Van Books, um, which I co-founded in 1994 with my husband, Jeffrey Skinner, and you will meet him. Uh, Jeffrey continues to teach at uh, UOL, um, the creative writing department, and I run the press. So basically, uh, his contribution to Saraband um, is mostly as sort of an adjunct reader and editor. Um, he's also writing this book, which I'll tell you about. Um, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Some of the material I'm going to be talking about is a little complicated so later on, and I even have some trouble understanding it. So um, give. just make sure that you. Um, a lot of people ask, where did you get this name, Sarah Van? Um, well, uh, we had to come up with a name for a press, and when we started dreaming up wonderful names, we got a list of about 20 and went to the library, uh, to one of those old-fashioned databases, which were then these big boxes, big metal boxes, and yellow print on the screen, and looked up our wishes, you know, the various names that we came up with on their database, which was two million businesses, and found every single one of them taken. So um, there are basically at least 150,000 publishers um, in the United States, and that's an old figure. I suspect that there are more now. Um, so a lot of the good names have already been grabbed up. Um, so what we did is we went to um, the library and got out books on astronomy and on birds and on flowers and music and a bunch of other things and began to comb through the indices of these and to come up with some names that came from there. We came up with four or five 
and all but two were taken. One was Stanza, Stanza Books, um, a very attractive name, um, probably for a poetry pu uh, publisher because Stanza in Italian means room. And we love this idea of the room, of the, but it doesn't work for a fiction publisher, so that went out the window. And Sarah Band is the one that's stuck. It has nothing to do with my name, um, something that's been a liability as we go along, everybody says, oh, it's Sarah's band, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not the case. We, it's, we thought it was a very beautiful word, and um, still do. And so once we had settled on um, the name Sarah Band, um, I went to the library to do some research on that word and discovered that the Sarah Band is actually originated in the New World, in Latin America, as an Aztec mating ritual. It was a sex dance. And... Um, it was uh, observed by the Span Spaniards, who then um, imported it to Spain, where in um, 1583, it was banned under pen penalty of death. Nobody could dance this dance, which was called the Zadabanda. Um, <clears throat> that didn't last forever. Uh, the English, the French, and the Germans um, adopted the dance and toned it down, civilized it into this sort of elegant and stately piece of music and dance that it presently is. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, and anybody who plays the piano these days, who takes piano lessons, will recognize the form. Um, it's a musical form from the French Suites by Bach. Um, Handel has a wonderful saraband. Beautiful, stately piece. But we loved this idea of this accomplished, professional, beautiful surface and this wild underside. It's history being sort of rooted in the body and the heart, um, and its surface being very accomplished and elegant. Um, and many of our books are like this. Um, they have this wonderful balance between head and heart, um, and that's what we look for when we publish. So um, that was very nice um, to have a name but um, let me just tell you how we came up with the idea of starting a press at all. Um, we were having dinner. Um, this was the early 90s. Um, and we were having dinner with a rich person at our house. And this woman and I and Jeffrey were bemoaning the fact that there were so many uh, literary publishers closing their doors. Um, it, there was a recession in the early 90s, and um, some of the greatest um, literary publishers were just not doing it anymore. They couldn't afford to. Um, University of Princeton Press also um, closed their doors to poetry. Um, there, were, there was a lovely press called Dragon Gate out on the West Coast. They closed their doors. Louisiana State University closed their doors or just sort of postponed publishing any more poetry and short fiction. Um, so it's a bleak time, and this woman said, geez, you know, it would be nice to offer some good news for a change. Um, this woman was a, a writer herself, and a fiction writer, chiefly. And we said, yeah, that would be so great. You know, we, we, we knew the business, and we knew how hard it was to get published. And she said, well, I, I'd be willing to fund something like this, but I just don't want to do any work. Um, <clears throat> so I raised my hand, and I said, yeah. Um, I'll do the work. <laughs> and she said, good, that's great. And um, of course, we didn't think much of it um, because you know these things pass in conversation and nothing comes to fruition. But in, at the end of December of 1993, I received a, a decent-sized um, check in the mail um, to do some research for the next year to begin a literary publishing house. Um, and this benefactor has continued to give us money um, since then. Um, we've been decreasing our dependency on her donations over the years and increasing our own income. Um, so it initially was our, all of our income, but now it's only about 45%. Um, so we started business. Um, I spoke to other independent publishers across the United States. I spoke to marketing directors and distributors. I spoke to um, editors and um, board members. I assembled um, a board of directors, mostly people we knew. Um, I found an advisory board of famous people, famous writers and famous publishers. Um, 
the, the good news was that I had already been in the poetry and short fiction business for 20 years, so I had a lot of contacts. Um, so we set up an advisory board with Louise Glick and Bobby Ann Mason, who's a famous Kentucky fiction writer. Um, who else? Uh, some other presses. Uh, so our, and we began to produce our first stationery. <laughs> so once we had our masthead and our stationery, um, we began to to think about how to garner manuscripts. We had no books at this point. Um, so what we did is we decided to run a liter two literary contests. One, a poetry contest named after my mother, who died in 1980, uh, called the Catherine A. Morton Prize in Poetry. And the other one is the Mary McCarthy Prize in Short Fiction. So those were going to be the two genres that we chose at that point. Um, we ran um, the contest. We advertised it. Um, we did not require an entry fee. Um, so the first year, we received um, roughly 2,500 manuscripts in a six-week period. Uh, this is a huge amount of paper. Uh, the poetry manuscripts were in duplicate, um, and there were at least 1,500 of those. And the um, fiction manuscripts were also in duplicate. Um, and you know what a fiction manuscript looks like. It's about that thick. Um, two of them is about that thick. Um, so we had about eight, eight or 900 of those. Um, and we proceeded to read them all um, with the help of some first readers, some screeners, and then select uh, 10 to send to the judges. Uh, we had final judges with great reputations, Philip Levine and Amy Bloom. Uh, they selected one each, and we selected an additional two books from this massive amount of paper. Um, we asked the recycling people to come and pick up the paper, um, after we were finished, and it weighed two tons, literally. Oh, That's how much paper there was. Uh, things have gotten a little less excessive um, over the years. We now receive manuscripts through the internet. You know, there's not as much waste, I'm happy to say. Um, so our first year in 1996, we published three books of poems and one book of short fiction. And I, my first hire was um, a woman from University of Pittsburgh, who became our marketing department, and she um, she went to New York immediately before we even had books um, with a beautiful red folder with our logo on the front. We had a beautiful logo design. You've seen what they what it looks like um, in the warm humanistic colors of yellow and red. Um, we went to. And on the inside, we had a press release announcing our presence and a mission statement. And we had a staff photo, which was pretty funny because it was just me <laughs> and um, Nicole at that point. So rather than you know make it look like it's pretty pathetic, um, we got all of our friends and a dog. And we had this picture taken, and so we looked bigger than we actually were. So that was fun. Um, but that visit, that face-to-face -face visit with the New York Times, with Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, all of the bookstores in New York, um, all of the other reviewers, um, was crucial because people saw that we were running a professional organization. And um, indeed, when it came time to publish our first books, um, the New York Times reviewed our fiction book, and the, the poetry books were reviewed by everybody else. And the New York Times basically does review poetry. Um, so we got a lot of coverage from that visit um, and a lot of respect initially. So the next year, 97, we published six books, and then eight books, and then 10 books, and then we went up to 12 books. Everybody panicked, so we went back down to 10 books, and that's what we do now. We publish a book every six weeks, and it's uh, a mix of poetry, maybe four titles in poetry, um, four fiction, um, and now we're doing creative nonfiction. We started that genre as well um, about six years ago. Um, and we're doing maybe three or four of those, depending on the mix from the prose side. Um, the other thing that we did is, before we even had any books, I personally visited the two major um, distributors of independent press, presses. Uh, one was in California, and one was in Minnesota. And all I had was stationery. 
at that point. I had no sales record, um, but uh, luckily I had people on my letterhead that they recognized and respected, including the president of the American Booksellers Association, who happened to introduce my sister and her husband. <laughs> so that's how I knew him. Um, but there were several other people he recognized as well as publishers. And he said, okay, we've never done this before, but we'll sign you up. And just make sure that you spend X number of dollars on marketing. And I said, we can do that. Um, initially, that figure was $5,000 per book. Um, that seems totally outrageous at this point. <laughs> so we've dropped that down considerably, but we didn't tell them that. <laughs> anyway. Um, any questions about that stage of that process yet? Yes, that's right. That's a good point. Um, a, an independent press is is basically in a very difficult situation without a distributor. Um, my first publisher did not have a distributor, and basically they had to ship, store, and ship and store all the books. They also had to make all the booksellers in the United States aware of the presence and of the upcoming titles. So they had to mail press releases and deal with all the other publishers who were mailing materials to them. Um, they also had to collect, and this is probably a very big part of what a distributor does, collect the money from the booksellers. You know, um, um, we don't have to do that. We now have a distributor, we had a distributor then who stores all the books for us who um, has a marketing department. Um, they publish a catalog every season. Um, they distribute, at this point their name is Consortium Book Sales and Distribution. They distribute 150 different publishers, um, but they're all sort of the Saraband type, um, independent publishers. Um, there's a very large um, a book conference in the United States called Book Expo. Uh, where all the publishers go across the board. Um, their favorite, all the, when the librarians and the reviewers and all the book buyers come, their favorite aisle is the consortium aisle because that's where publishers publish things of the heart and of aesthetic interest and not this mass market sensibility. Um, so I'll, well, I'll talk about how this distributor has become increasingly important in the digital age as well. <coughs> um, I can get to that later. But does everybody understand what the distributors do? Um, they basically ship, store, they have a team of 45 sales reps, sales representatives. And these people have territories in the United States. They go visit the independent bookstores, they visit Barnes and Noble and Borders in Walden and um, all the other places, and they market our books, they pitch them. Um, they don't have a whole lot of time to pitch the books, so that's why we have to tell them what our lead title is. So, so they'll have time for like one book per publisher. Um, but they establish relationships with, with these booksellers and we don't have to do it. All we have to do is get the books off the bookstore shelves by marketing ourselves to the public, the reading public. Um, what else do they do? They keep us apprised of changes in the industry and boy, that matters now. Um, that's because things are changing so fast, but I will be talking about that. Um, yeah. You publish only for celebrities that you well known by as well known so oh, no. how can you judge that this book is gonna sell prior to that it's not gonna sell? I mean I went to, to several countries, neighboring countries in trying to publish certain things, mm -hmm. translations of certain poetry and stuff like this. And they just wouldn't accept it because it wouldn't sell because nobody knows me for example. So how yeah. can you judge if this book is gonna sell or not? We, well, if I had the answer to that question, I'd be a rich woman. <laughs> but you have to understand, we deliberately chose the uh, poor cousins of a publishing world, poetry, short fiction, and creative nonfiction. We know that these are never going to sell that much. Uh, poetry generally sells about 1,000 copies, if we're lucky. Um, short fiction can sell anywhere from 1,500 copies to 9,000 copies. Um, creative nonfiction. <laughs> Well, we're, we're just starting on that, so we sell about a thousand of that too. So. But I'll be getting to some of that when we move along here. Um, so there are... Here you go. Here. That's a better one. There are three words that, that describe us.
um, independent, nonprofit, and literary. Um, the the old name for presses like us used to be small press, and um, this was back in the the seventies. This and um, you know, most of those small presses were run by hippies in their garage. Um, they had their own little printing press where they went to a copier shop and stapled everything together. Um, they didn't have much of a business sense, um, and they had practically no distribution. Um, it was sort of run, these presses were run by the seat of their pants. Um, but things have changed a lot. Um, back when um, those presses started, a handful of them are still alive, but it took them roughly 15 years to even become noticed. Um, whereas Saraban just stepped right into the limelight. Um, and things have changed so much. Uh, we now do um, extremely professional, we are, these presses are all now run extremely professionally. They have accountants, they do audits. Um, they have a marketing department. They do analysis of, of their book sales. Um, they have professional marketing. They have professional design and production. The books from the old days, you know, very, very sketchy looking, maybe um, cheaply produced. Um, but now the, our, our books are beautifully produced, and um, they have to be to compete with other books in the world. Um, so, we wanted to get rid of that stereotype um, that's sort of inherent in the word small, um, and so the word independent was, was sort of um, kind of came into use. It also ties us with independent films and independent booksellers, um, that link, and independent musicians. So, see, that link of um, people became our market and our community. Um, notice I say independent, but but not huge. Um, we're not small, but we're not huge either, like the current commercial publishers, which are run by, which basically come from an, uh, come under an umbrella of a huge conglomerate, a huge corporation, like Bertelsmann, I, be, I believe, and Random House. Um, they don't have any independence, but they have financial protection. So this is sort of how we distinguish ourselves from the New York publishers. Independence also, um, are spread out all over the country. They, there are a lot of them located in New York, but some are in Seattle, and there's five or six of really good ones in Minneapolis. There's one in Kentucky. Um, they're all over the map. Um, it's sort of showing everyone that publishing doesn't have to be located in New York. Um, we are also not a university press. Um, university presses generally get funding from um, the university, although that's decreasing over the years drastically. Um, university presses also have to, they used to publish basically, let's say, pretty humdrum um, uh, production, you know, goals, you know, just a, a blank color and a, a title on it, but now they have to compete with all the other books as well. Um, so their production values are really increasing too. But we don't have the production of a university, um, so we are totally. Um, here are some writers that were published by Independents, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, Thoreau, Whitman, Huckleberry Finn was published by an independent, Edgar Allan Poe, Melville's later works, The Bokoff, Joyce, Blake, Shelley, Byron, Howell by Ginsburg, which celebrated its 50th anniversary, was published by City Lights, and which is a bookstore in San Francisco, but also they published their 50th anniversary too. I mean, they, they are, a, and they're still going, they're a wonderful press. Um, and they're distributed by consortium, so we get to know them very well. So what are the advantages in being independent? We can make talent our bottom line. Um, we do not have to run our titles by the marketing department before we can publish them. I have a cousin, Nan Graham, who is the senior editor and vice president of Scribner and Simon and & Schuster. And she, um, she basically s discovered and signed um, Frank McCourt's <coughs> An Angela's <coughs> Ashes. Uh, that was an enormous success. Um, she sold, I think, two million copies and counting. Um, but um, her boss the next year came up to her and said, well, that was fantastic. You did a great job. Next year, we'd like you to do 10% better. And th this was a once-in-a-lifetime sign. But since then, she signed Stephen King, which is sort of 
less uh, interesting to me. Um, and she's got, oh gosh, um, she has Salman Rushdie on her list, um, really good people. But the story with her is that she goes into a room full of, full of marketing people and she has to pitch the title. And the, um, her pitch consists of what's the audience for this? What, um, what's special about this book? What is it? like what book is it like out there that's sold very well um you know what's the cover going to look like very little about the content of the book so she just that's the way their business runs and we get to make talent our first um our first priority um we make most of the um we publish a lot of debut collections we make lots of discoveries of wonderful writers who then go on to publish with big houses um, we also revive careers. Um, some people who publish with commercial houses don't sell 50,000 copies of their book, and so they find themselves with no publisher after that for the next book, and we revive their career. We take them on. Um, we also do a lot of translations, um, not Saraban per se, but other independents. And um, we do the... the um, the, the um, genres that that the mainstream houses are not doing. Um, the other thing is that we only have 10 titles. So when you become a Saraband author, you get a lot of attention. Um, you get to decide what the book cover looks like. You get to um, you get to talk, you know you you have a special person on staff who help helps you market the book and who sets up a tour for you. Um, we do a lot of editing. Uh, most of the larger houses have stopped doing that. Um, we will work with a talent who is just, you know, really kind of rough and disorganized and shape a manuscript um, if we think it's worthy of that. And we tend, we like to hang on to our authors too. Um, we keep our books in print, um, and the major publishers don't do that. And it's very pretty typical for a Scribner to give a book about six months, and then if um, it's not selling well, they'll pulp the rest of the copies. They'll basically recycle them and um, you're out of print suddenly. Um, on the other hand, um, we don't have protection, um, so we have to sort of scurry to do fundraising and a variety of other things to keep going. Um, and that takes up an enormous amount of my time. Uh, okay, the next one is nonprofit. Um, actually, the word nonprofit is sort of um, a misnomer. Um, because it fo focuses on, on you know, whether you make a profit or not. There are tax-exempt organizations like hospitals and um, or, uh, you know, universities and that sort of thing that, um, that make a slight profit, um, and yet they're still called nonprofits. So technically it's just um, a tax <coughs> category, right? Um, it means that we do not have to pay taxes on whatever our profits are. We never have profits. Um, but the advantage to this is that we can look to other sources for income. For example, um, I'm going to show you a little pie. Um, I'm not going to do this accurately. Um, our, our book sales constitute maybe, I don't know, 35% of our income, which is pretty low. Um, donations. I would say this is 45%. Um, and this is from both major donors, like our, our original donors from individuals and twice a year we have to run a fundraising campaign we have fundraising parties um, we do whatever we can to raise money and then when, um, for our contest we have entry fees we now charge $27 for an entrance to the contest and that's about ends up being about $35,000 so it's a smaller piece of the pie um, then we have grants If we did not have 501c3 status, if we did not um, work our nonprofit, we wouldn't be able to apply for grants. And we have received funding from the 
the NEA every year except two since That's we began. The National Endowment for the Arts. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we've got significant <laughs> amount of money from them, um, sometimes as high as forty thousand um, dollars. We've also received money from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Foundation, and the Kentucky Arts Council gives us regular funding to anywhere from twenty to twenty-five thousand. Um, that involves a lot of work on my part because I have to write these long narratives and collect materials. So about 35% of my time is spent doing that. And then this can be miscellaneous, you know. Sometimes we sell our um, foreign, trips, foreign translation rights to, we've sold rights in Korea, France, um, England, and we get a chunk of cash for that. Um, so there's a bunch of other ways of doing it. An ideal organization of our type would be half, or maybe even 60% book sales and the rest donations and grants. Um, we're not there yet. Part of the clear difference between this and the big for-profit bestseller <laughs> publishers is the, the income from book sales mm -hmm. constitutes everything. everything or almost everything that they're yeah. taking in. That's you know they're profit making corporations and that's how they operate. Right, right. We would be lost if that was the case for us. There's no reason. So I, I sort of want to do a little math and show you what that means. The book sales. <coughs> how the graphs is different from the donation Donations are are uh, right. are gifts. individuals gifts. Individual. Yes. And that's Foundations too. Okay, here's a little math. You can go to sleep now since you've already heard this. <laughs> I, I always want to find it. Okay, here's a poetry book, right? 1395, we've actually raised our price to 1495, but I don't have the math on that. I'm not going to do it my head. Um, okay, first thing that comes off the top, this is called the cover price or the wholesale price, the retail price. Um, first thing that comes off is when you are selling your book or placing your book in a bookseller, a bookseller gets a discount of 40%. That's the lowest discount they get. You can run all the way up to 50%. So that leaves us with $8.37. Okay, the next thing that happens is the distributor takes their cut. Now, we don't get those distributor fee frees of free. services for free, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, at least 26%, and they have been upping that. Okay, so that brings it down to $6.19. <laughs> okay, now the author. The author gets a royalty. Um, generally, the, most, the commercial houses will give the author a royalty at the cover price. Um, we don't do that. <laughs> we give them um, a percentage, usually 10%. Um, of the discount price? Or of the no, of the, what we call um, the net. net. Um, or the cover price less fees. So they want to know specifically what the fees we give it to them. Yeah, it's five dollars a part. Okay, um, if we are dealing with an agent, if some of our fiction writers have agents, um, we will change this slightly, but you know, not as much to change. Okay. Just let me, let me just note that the author is getting about 62 cents per copy. This is why poets don't get rich. Unless <laughs> <laughs> you're Billy Collins, and then you get really rich. So it's the less pain, man. Okay, so now we have uh, this is production costs. Production generally, uh, we end up paying about three dollars per um, book. That's our unit cost um, for all of our paperbacks. We used to do cloth editions too; those were down to ten dollars a book. So we don't do those anymore. Um, so that brings the total. Okay, well that's subtracted from here. Just 
works. No, no, no. Um, it's 222, two, two, whatever. 257. Um, two yeah. 257 is the net, the real net, the bottom line except that we have to cover marketing costs, overhead, including salaries, health benefits, rent, all the stuff that keeps an office home. So you can see how very quickly you can run into the red here. Um, you can lose money on the book. Um, and generally, our first edition of maybe 1,500 copies, if it sells through and we go into a second edition, um, the production costs are much cheaper and we can start making a profit at that point. Our best seller was a fiction title. We sold 9,000 copies, which we've not been able to repeat since. Yeah. Um, but we made an extra $56,000 off of that um, book. That was profit. And we ended up being able to publish all these other poetry and short fiction collections because of that. Um, so I wish it happened more often. But, you know, we're not there yet. Um, OK. The other thing about nonprofit is that you have to be um, this I didn't understand at the beginning. Um, the, the tax uh, department in the United States has to figure out what the difference is between Harper and Rowe, Harper Collins, Simon and Schuster, Scribner, Random House, and Saraband. To uh, to them, they look the, we look the same. I mean, we look exactly the same. So why shouldn't we be taxed the same? Well, what we had to establish was that we offer education, uh, educational services as well as just publication. Um, and so I sort of begrudgingly um, instituted an educational program in um, our publishing house, and about 30% of our activity is now um, education. And frankly, I enjoy that as much as I do the rest of the stuff. I'm um, happy that we're doing it. It, um, it. We go into universities, we give workshops, we do um, panel discussions. Um, our authors go out and talk to people. Um, meet students. Um, we also have this fabulous website if you want to take a look. Um, it's sarabandbooks.org um, slash SIE, which is Saraband in Education. Um, this was a gift from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. They gave us $75,000 in um, 1999, a three-year grant. Um, they gave us uh, 75 to, to um, create this program of, um, of, of a, an educational support program for um, the books that we publish. So every single book has a reader's guide filled with questions um, for the students that were created by the authors, the reading lists that the authors suggest, um, live author chats, and we can do this by Skype now, um, so that the authors can come into the classroom and talk to students directly without having to pay anything to get there, and so on. And interviews, and um, I mean, it's just reviews. It's just a tremendous source. And every single one of our books has this. Um, because it's, it's different from other um, reader's guides because it's created by the author. And that also takes some of the work off of our shoulders, too. So that's a terrific program. You should take a look. Um, OK, and now literary. Um, obviously, we don't do cookbooks, we don't do chicken soup, um, we don't do Civil War histories, although I get at least one phone call a day from some old fellow who wants to publish a Civil War history with us. Um, the, the other thing that we don't do is sort of the mainstream, I don't know exactly what to describe them, I, I think the, the women's version of this has been called chiclet. Um, these are sort of loosely conversationally, um, in my opinion, lazily uh, written novels um, that appeal to women, uh, young women in particular. Uh, we don't do that. There's this sort of blurring going on what is really an aesthetically pleasing novel and what is just a mainstream novel. Um, we don't do that sort of thing. In fact, we had somebody just send us a manuscript. She used to run OK Magazine. It was very well, well written. It just didn't have the kind of aesthetic um, depth that we were looking for, the, the innovation, the, the sort of full-fledged characters, um, the 
interesting insights, all of that stuff. But it was a good read. You know, but we just don't do that. Um, it has to be slightly challenging, um, at the very least. Uh, because literature, we still believe, is an art. Um, we have a lot of trouble convincing people of that, but it is. At least the stuff we've been publishing. Um, we launch new writers, as I said, and rediscover old writers. One of my favorite stories um, um, is Eleanor Lerman. This is her. Um, when I was a young poet, and I was growing up as a poet, um, it was in the 70s, and at that point, there were very few women publishing. Uh, most of my role models were males. Um, Galway Cannell, W.S. Merwin. Um, there was a handful of women publishing, and one of them was Eleanor Lerman, and she had a book called Art to Love. This book was a big hit. It was published by University of, um, Wesleyan University Press. It was one of four finalists for the National Book Award. She had fans flocking to her apartment in Greenwich Village, and she published one more book after that, and then she disappeared for 25 years. There was no word from Eleanor Lerman. So when I started the press, I thought, gee, I wonder what happened to Eleanor? Um, I found her address, and I can't remember how I did that. Um, she'd been living in the same address in New York, and I sent her a FedEx package full of Saraband titles, and I said, hey, are you writing it? these days. And she said that package changed her life. Um, she was working for the Carnegie Foundation, and still is, um, but she had just started writing poetry again. And so she sent me 20 poems, and then um, over the next two years she sent me another 20, and together we formulated um, her third book, which had a 25 year gap um, from her second book, and um, which was called Mystery of Meteors. That won a library prize and sold and had many good reviews. And then we published her fourth book, uh, which was called uh, uh, My Post Soviet History Unfolds. That was the title of that one. That won the Lenore Marshall Prize from the Academy of American Poets, which is a $25,000 prize and very, very prestigious. Um, and then we published this book, which has been. Garrison Keeler from Writer's Almanac has used almost every poem in this book, and she won a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is thirty-five to $40,000, as well as a National Endowment for the Arts grant, all based on this sort of rediscovery. So she and I are sort of, you know, linked together in this really satisfying, wonderful way. Um, she's a brilliant poet. Um, she's funny and laid back, an old hippie, you know, it's basically what she is, but I love her. So that's the best best case scenario um, is being, being able to bring somebody up there out like that. Um, and I have to say that the other thing we publish uh, is our creative nonfiction, and we tend to go um, towards the innovative end of that. Um, we do something called, we publish a lot of what's called a lyric essay, um, which is a combination sort of fusing together of poetry and prose. Um, using some of the techniques of poetry, um, you know, like sound and um, associational leaps. Um, but I'll have to give you, that's a whole other thing, I'll give you examples of that. Um, but anyway, that's difficult to sell too, needless to say. Um, so, any questions at this point? I want to make, make one, one comment. Once again, if you, especially if you consider these numbers, this, this, this press's best-selling book of fiction sold 9,000 copies to a population of 360 million people. Right? <coughs> now, the point is, when we talk about literature, <coughs> there are books that, are, that, that sell widely, you know, but we're also talking about the persistence of an art form that had, that is a that has a small ongoing audience, except for those those big hits. And you know, a lot of the life of of literature goes on in with this with this much smaller audience, often connected to universities. Not always, certainly. Uh, but it's not, it's not as though literature in this country is, for the most part, big business. There are aspects of it that are, 
Toni Morrison's books are, um, anthologies of American literature that are used in universities all over the country are very lucrative if they are successful and they make a lot of money. But the life of literature, like the life of, of most art forms, uh, does not go on in the big corporations. And it does not have the kind of mass readership um, that a few books get. You know, a few, a few good books and many bad books. You know? yes. there, is a, there is a real distinction between mass market and writing that is mass market entertainment and writing that is an attempt to make serious art. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if, as you say, chick literature or chick lit, you know, sells very well, why don't you uh, have a proportion of your production uh, I mean, given to that kind of literature so as to make the business run? I mean... You know, that's a very good question, and my husband yes. was asking me that question. <laughs> 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 oh, and he said, why don't you... <laughs> that's really tough. Yeah. Um, you know, I have the opportunity right now to do that, but the point is that we have been branded as a literary publisher now. We have worked very hard to get that brand, um, that our prose is high quality, um, it's not mass market, so even if we published one of those books, um, I, first of all, I think it would be ignored um, because it didn't come from the kind of place that you would expect it to come. Um, and I, I think that the donors, as well as the grantors, would look on us with a very strange eye. Right. Um, you know, what is going on here? Why are they doing this? On the other hand, my husband wants us to, to um, run a mystery contest judged by Sue Grafton and you know make a little money that way and it's the same story you know I mean everybody's gonna go huh <laughs> um, and I have never seen an independent press do that I've never seen them just take on something that, that would make some money. Well, this kind of writing has its own publishing houses I think this or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. And they they're, have their they're the commercial houses. Commercial yeah. houses. Right. There are books in this country that sell millions of copies by and large, they are not books that you want to teach in your literature course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, Dr. Baez, this is a very different kind of an insight we are getting. And, and thank you for putting this element in our program. This is you know, the, pub, the entire gamut of publishing. Is, it is such a different insight that we keep on teaching as teachers uh, books. But we don't know really this this kind of a pie chart or this kind of a map that you get. This is so very different. Uh, um, that is one thing. Uh, uh, were you or are you at any point of time inspired by Leonard and Virginia Woolf mm -hmm. and the Hogarth Press? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, of course. Well, that was and, an independent press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have there are great, great f distinguished writers that come from our tradition. And do, and do you accept, I mean, for scrutiny, uh, uh, writers from outside USA? Um, no, not at this stage. Um, we decided that was one of our mission statement, that was one of the things that we included, was that we um, wanted to focus on American writers. We had to sort of cut it down. Um, and so also translation, we've done a couple of translations um, that were reasonably successful. We did a couple of uh, a pair of um, Mexican and American um, poetry anthologies, um, bilingual, um, and sold in Mexico and here. Um, and we did a, a, a collection of three Korean poets um, in translation. Um, but there are other presses, other independent presses that focus on translation exclusively. Um, Wonderful Archipel Archipelago in New York um, is really a terrific press is bringing a lot of great books into the United States. Um, and they're funded by a big foundation called the Lannan Foundation. Um, so uh, even though we'd like to kind of push in that market as well, um, we just, I think we're busy enough as it is. And we have enough material now as it is too. One of the very sad things once we had as a department, we called in a poet, 70 plus year old uh, Indian poet writing in English, who's in the literary history books, a canonical figure. 
But uh, then we asked him that the last 10 years you have not been publishing. Why is it so? And uh, he, he said, I go around now in this age with a new manuscript under my armpit and there's nobody there to publish it anymore. A, a very sad uh, state. Yeah. He's there in, in the history of Indian English writing, but nobody publishes anymore. Nobody's so publishing that poetry then. anymore. So that's really? a, a great apathy towards poetry, especially. Oh. Well, there's somewhat of an apathy towards yeah. poetry here, antipathy. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's tragic. Yeah. But did you know that 98% um, mm -hmm. of the poetry published in the United States is published by independents? That gives you a sense of where mm. where we belong and where they belong. Um, the major houses will publish Billy Collins. They're all over Billy Collins um, because he sells very well. Yeah. Thank you. My question is, uh, um, I was looking at these two books, and I see that they were not published by Sarah Dem. Yes, that's right. So uh, if we published our own material, that would be considered vanity publishing okay. and self-publishing, and that's looked down on by everybody. But I have a very good publisher who's also an independent, so it's not very I hate to have to market my own book, which I have to do. Do you have or do you intend to have a representation outside of the US? Uh, sorry, I do you have, presently have a presentation or do you uh, intend to represent an outside of the US? Okay. Um, we do. Um, we have distribution in England and um, at the moment um, digital or digital ebooks um, are going to be spread worldwide. So our, our distributor is working on that right now. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. You're going to have a certain site for e-books? Yeah, that's my next subject. Right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very anxious to hear about your observations about e-books, too. Um, you know, it's funny because I've done this lecture many times, and um, I prepare a little talk, and there's always a section called Important Developments in Publishing. And, you know, I was pretty sleepy for about five years. And nothing much happened. Oh my God. In the last two years, it's like whammo. And even since last year, and I would have to say, even in, since two weeks ago, I have, to, have had to change my um, presentation slightly because some new innovation had come up, new requirements, new technology. Um, it's mind-boggling. Mind it's, it's so difficult to keep up with. Um, running a publishing house is difficult in itself, but you know, with four full-time staff members and two um, interns, we are doing, we are paddling as fast as we can, is all I can say. Um, so, what I want to do is to look at one of these. Yeah. Which one? You yeah, have three. You have three. I'm going to decide we have two. E-book. Yeah. The first one I want you to look is it says dollars change. Mm -hmm. The one with the blue and mm -hmm. blue and orange stripes. Yeah, yeah some more copies from this one. This one's yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry. What do you need copies of? Which yeah. one? Yeah. This one. Did they come back? Well, maybe somebody can share. Okay, share it here. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so everybody should have three. The first one we're going to look at has the orange and blue stripes. Is that is extra? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first of all, I want you to ignore everything else on the page. There's a lot of busyness here, and just look at the, the long lines, <laughs> um, and not attempt to distinguish between them, the colors. Um, what you see first at the very top of the, of the graph is, is that the two um, places that sell the most books are, number one, um, the internet or e-commerce, um, and that number two, bookstore chains, um, that's Borders, Barnes & Noble, no Borders anymore, but um, Barnes & Noble and so on. So obviously, um, 
a great deal of books are being sold through these two sources. And that's, that's not what, the only news in there is the internet sales. Uh, but we've known that that's been growing over the years and so on. And then you come back down, um, and I'm not really interested in the other book clubs and non-traditional bookstores and mass merchandises, but right under that is independent bookstores. Um, do you mm. see that with mm. the five percent mm. share of the market? Five mm. percent both years mm. stable. At least it's stable um, between 2009 and 2010. Um, our when I started this business, um, independent bookstores like Carmichael's and Holly Cook was no longer here. These are the small um, uh, locally owned. Local, thank you. Locally owned um, bookstores that have booksellers hand selling things the old fashioned way. Um, we used to sell 46% of our books to those kinds of bookstores, and now it's down to 5%. Actually, for us, it's more like 8%. It's a little higher. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. You know, most of them are dropping out. Um, they can no longer make, uh, do any business. Um, they're rare, much more rare than they used to be. Uh, but that's, I think, one of the saddest effects of technology, is the loss of the independent neighborhood bookstore. Um, Okay, so as you can see, it's very important for us to stay alive, to both be um, accessible to the chains and also accessible to web, the web, um, the internet. Okay, the other thing to look at is um, the difference in color in those two, the first two, the e-commerce and bookstore chains. Now, 2010 is blue mm. and 2009 is orange, and you can see but e-commerce has actually um, overtaken yep. uh, bookstore chains. 30% mm -hmm. uh, of the sales in 2010 to 29% uh, in bookstore chains uh, in 2009. And that's pretty remarkable. Um, so that, you know, even the bookstore chains are having trouble. Uh, you know, uh, what's it say? Borders just went belly up, bankrupt. Barnes and Nobles, you know, hanging in there, but I suspect there'll be things, changes there as well. Uh, so th that's very informative. Um, I remember uh, when we first received this Lila Wallace Reader's Digest um, grant, one of the wonderful perks was that we had these publishers meetings three years in a row, and we had experts from the field come in and talk about changes in technology and where they, where they saw the books going. And so all of the grantees got to listen to this sort of inside information. Um, and one guy came in with um, a little metal box, uh, which he passed around and said, this is the future of literature. And we looked at it, and it had some, you know, dad, some words on the screen. And it was pretty uh, ridiculous, we thought. We passed it around. And he said, people are going to be reading books. And that was 12 years ago. He was right. Um, we now have um, e-readers, e um, and they are going somewhere. Um, they are no longer just um, available to the experts. I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I fly four or five times a year, and I've seen over the years the number of Kindles and Nooks and iPads increase drastically. The iPad, for example, sold 3 million units in three weeks. Um, but to my surprise, the Kindle is still up there as the primary e-reader. And iPad is just slowly gaining some popularity. But, uh, so what does that mean? That means that if people are using these devices, we have to have our books in electronic format where they are not going to be reading our books. At least that's the message we got. And our distributor told us just this last time in May when we were in New York that they saw a 550% increase in um, e-book sales over the last quarter. That was just the last quarter. Um, now granted, a lot of that's backlist because people are going to their backlist first, converting those to e-books, which is a wonderful thing because basically, you know, you've sold, you've published, like we've said, published 140 books in print. Um, and basically, 120 of those are sort of lost by the wayside, you know, with sort of dribbling sales. This is a way to revive interest in your backlist and those books that are still sitting in the warehouse. <coughs> um, and so one of the things they told us 
what initially this was 18 months ago they said only only put only convert your your backlist okay and only do the prose titles don't do the poetry yet um, then we heard wait a year before publishing the ebook version of your front list so you were giving a book of book in a book out in print publishing a book in print and then a year later you're doing it in ebook format that's what that way they will not compete with each other well then it was it was shown to be that they do not compete with each other that um, new buyers who would normally not public not, not purchase a print book are buying ebooks so that the um, the caught the the net is that this is an additive source of sale um, that we are actually seeing increased revenue sales. Um, so that was the thing. Then then what we were supposed to do is to publish them at the same time. Okay? And now basically they're saying publish all your books in electronic format and you better get them out there fast. <laughs> so and this is all over, you know, a year. Um, so that we have to keep kind of pushing to get our, our books in, in ebook format. Uh, poetry, uh, nobody has figured out how to do line breaks yet. Um, so you know when you publish a book in digital form, you use something called flow text, um, in which the, 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 pro, uh, the text just flows naturally to the shape of a page. Um, that's going to be really screwed up in poetry because there are line breaks. There are long line breaks. There are tabs. There are big white spaces. And um, you would see a poetry book looking something like a big block of text. And that's going to just kill the poets because they work very hard on those line breaks, you know, like very hard on those white spaces, and they don't want them destroyed. So there is a, an independent publisher out in Seattle that just received a $100,000 grant to pursue software that will um, retain the integrity of a poem on a book. I haven't gotten anywhere yet, but um, one of the terms of the grant is that this be shared with the entire independent publishing business, just the independent publishing business. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then finally, now, latest, this is the latest, this was last week, I heard of a publisher <coughs> bundling the ebook with the print book. Um, it's Algonquin Publishers, and actually the, one of their um, directors, Shannon Ravenel, was on my board. And she said they are now using ebooks as marketing devices so that if you buy a, a book in print or hardback, you get the free download of the ebook as well. Um, this is similar to the this is similar to the music industry, which is, there. you know, they do these premium editions where you buy the vinyl, and then you also get a little card which gives you a password and a username for a download of the music from the internet as well. And they, you know, they can pay, you pay a little bit more for this. And uh, I, I'm really distressed by this. And I, I, you know, because I was happy about it, ebooks. I finally got to the point where I was happy because I could see that they do garner some extra income. We've sold 100 ebooks, and we get more of that money um, because there's no distributor. The only thing that we have to take out of there is the 50% uh, that Amazon charges on every ebook. Um, and we have this incredible service at our distributor. I don't know what other publishers do, but they will take a PDF file of our book, which includes the cover and every single page in the book, and they will convert it to iPad, Nook, Sony, um, Kindle, uh, you know that, what's it, glance, look inside the book, um, Google, all of those different formats, they're all different formats, they will convert it for us for uh, $200. So, you know, our costs for producing an ebook book are very minimal, and we get quite a bit more money back. On the other hand, the author gets 25% instead of 10% of that net price, but still, I think they deserve that. That's good. Yeah, that's really so that's you guys the and the authors are making out of Yeah, well, as long as we can get more out there. Um, so, who buys these ebooks? Does anybody know? Do you buy ebooks? Mm -hmm. Do you buy them personally? Yeah, I get them. Are you usually start to go with the ones that you can have well for free? But uh, definitely, we need to buy some. Um, uh, that summer, for example, we had to get, we got, um, 
we get the PDF format and the MP3 format of um, what's the name uh, of my men, for example, to do that right. in summer. And it was pretty interesting, very good. And unfortunately, yeah. my computer crashed now. I have to fix it, and I have that ebook in my damaged. Uh, yeah, well, you could have dropped the book in the but, water too. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. But actually, it's important. Right. Well, actually, students, um, they did a survey, and students prefer um, a print version of the dictionary, for example, and the textbook. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so they don't like looking on screen for that. Um, I mean, that I surprised would, me. But. I would prefer the internet. I and since we don't know mine, it is always difficult for us to get like everything in time. So the ebook is faster. Yeah, well, that's the no question. That's, that's, that's faster. Yeah. I think the internet uh, gives us the the reason to you know, books, published books, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's difficult to have a recent book which is published 2010 back back home. So I think the internet is, is a very uh, rich yeah. uh, source for books. This is one thing. The other thing is that there are certain free sites for ebooks, just like Gigapedia, mm -hmm. which is now changed to library.onu. You go to that site and you download ebooks for free. I yeah. think it's very popular back home because we don't have, you know, visa cards or credit cards to, to buy books. Sometimes it's very difficult. I need a book which is there in the internet, but I have to pay, for example, ten bucks, and I don't know how to pay them because I don't have credit cards. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. so this yeah. is why we well, go yeah. to these three sites to yeah. download whatever there is. But I think they are very popular now back home in my country. Well, that is definitely. I mean, how can you argue with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody else have something to say? Yeah. I have something to say. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, one of the things that I find that is very attractive for us about EFL context uh, literature classes is that we get some um, extras with that, like for example, in MP3, someone reading it, you understand? We sometimes don't have like a proper reader for that. Mm -hmm. and, and it is very important to hear an experienced and well recorded voice understand very properly then I think that if you put those little atoms, if you had I don't know video something to sell with it, that would sell dramatically a lot. I mean especially in you know, what I said in Latin America for example, we, we really depend a lot on recording material. Um well so anyway, who buys ebooks in the United States? Uh, since last week um, <laughs> before last week um, it was my impression, and I had been told by charts and graphs, that uh, women above the age of 50 were the primary audience for ebooks. And what they did is they bought romance novels and mysteries, you know, those little mass market books that piled up in my mother in law's house, you know, and they're up to the ceiling everywhere. Um, so there's a great advantage in, in buying that as a download. For, and one of the advantages is that you can read it on the subway, and nobody knows what you're reading. Um, and so you don't have to be embarrassed that you're reading a romance novel. Um, but, <laughs> but let's look at the next um, chart, which is this one, a bar, a bar chart, a bar graph. Um, the truth is that that's changed already. Um, uh, you can see that literary and classic that means you know literature, not just contemporary literature, um, is now the the um, the top seller um, in ebook form, um, and it's distinguished from general romance, mystery, general fiction. Um, so literary is really up there, and that is good news for us. That really is. I, I was surprised by that and delighted. Um, and you can see biography and so on is, is below that. So, um, that just happened in the last couple of months. Now, is that, it says unit sales, but is that right. downloads or is that? Yes, downloads. Well, a lot of that stuff's free. That's oh, yes, that is the other problem. Mm -hmm. uh, market share of unit sales. Well, uh, you know, I don't know. Does they actually tell us that? I do. That's what I wondered. I just. Uh, because I remember. Consortium said that they couldn't distinguish between what had been purchased and what had been downloaded for free. So yeah, that would explain the classics because those are free. Um, 
those are pretty. Well, my husband is having a blast downloading stuff that was written in the 17th, 18th century. You know, it's now available for nothing. You have to go to the library. Um, See, okay. This is something you could do here if you chose to is to get e files of many, many classic books that are out of copyright for free in e form, and then you could take it back in your pocket if you mm. wanted to. On the other hand, I don't emphasize that to this group because they're not contemporary. <laughs> but um, it is a real. But it is a real. Going to have benefit of these things. <laughs> yes, yes. Our our resident medievalist. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've watched. The, you know, you've kept an eye on the New York Times book review lately, but they now have. They've now included ebooks in their bestseller lists, and they now have one, two. Three, four, five, six. That's it. That's it. Six pages devoted to bestseller lists, and including the ebooks, uh, paperbacks, cloth, and so forth. Um, that's six pages, or actually four of those, which we really don't need, um, uh, taken away from actual reviews, the number of which are shrinking drastically. So I think that's a, a horrible trend and a bad editorial decision on their part. I wish they would listen to me. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, what do you actually glean from reading these bestseller lists, except that Danielle Steele um, is always at the top, Stephen King is always at the top, and, you know, it's not really that much interesting information. Um, where are the other books that should be on the bestseller list, except that they're selling less than a million copies? Um, so Michael Durda, who was a Washington Post um, reviewer, suggested that um, a book could only be on the bestseller list um, in a month period or um, whatever long, I'm not sure what he said, once. And that would knock out all the bestsellers for a while and that some of the other, you know, some books that are selling only literary titles, for example, could rise to the top. That would be interesting to me. But I'm tired of looking at Danielle Steele's name. I really am, you know. Boy, she had a lot of work on her face. <laughs> um, well, she can afford it. She sure can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. The other thing that's happened in te technology are three things. It's very cheap. Um, this allows publishers like us to print like 200 copies that we send out to reviewers, and then when we get some orders in, we print that number of, of books. Um, so it's made publishing a lot easier. Um, the quality of print-on-demand books has really improved. Um, you can almost not tell it apart from a, um, an offset printer. And um, we don't use it for our initial press run. We use it for reprints. Because we publish our books with these beautiful embossed end sheets, and print on demand does not um, allow us to do that. Um, you can see this one, I'll pass it around. Um, this is one of those signature elements that, that gives Sarah Van a nice little piece of class. It's a very classy thing. Um, okay, and the other thing is, is um, Ex Libris. self-publishing companies where you can send in a manuscript, pay the publisher, 
and they will produce books for you. Um, and of course, uh, you know, self-published books are generally pretty bad because they haven't been vetted, but they are being now published in astronomical numbers. Now let's look at the next um, piece of information. We have book, book production by the numbers. And you can see that the total number at the very top 3,082,740 are the total number of titles published produced in 2010. I had no idea it was that high. Um, but um, you see beneath that, 2,766,000 and change um, non-traditional titles produced in 2010. Now that's a euphemism for self-published. That's how many people are taking this route in publishing their own books. And you can see the number under that, traditional titles, is more realistic. Those are the ones that were vetted by editors, that were, you know, went through the regular competitive process. Uh, 316,000 is enough right there. So that if you get a, a book review in the New York Times, you can, you can imagine the odds of getting a book review. I mean, it's anywhere, really, with that number of, of traditional titles being published. Um, the, the disturbing, um, Thing that's happening is is that the self-published books are now sort of working their way into the review venues. Publishers Weekly has an online section just for self-published books, and I think you know they deserve what they get. Is what I I say about that because I mean, they're getting to almost three million books um, sent their way just because they do a few reviews. <laughs> I'd love to work for them. Um, Anyway, the fiction, fiction production numbers are dropping slightly, but not, you know, that's an amazing, amazing development. And then finally, there's online publishing, and I will stop. Which is a nice development. This is, this is both uh, reviews being published online primarily, um, and then also, uh, magazine, literary magazines have been published online. Um, you don't have the kind of visibility or the something to hold in your hand, but it's cheap and it's allowed it's some wonderful material to get out there. Diagram is one of my favorite online um, literary magazines, as is Drunken Boat. And um, there's a wonderful reviewer called Beatrice.com, and the other one's Bookslut.com. Site. Okay. Okay. Fifteen minutes. Cut one or two of them out. I don't want to have time for all of them. Um, but we are going to pretend that we are readers for the literary contest, specifically the Catherine A. Morton Poetry Prize. Are there more copies coming around? Please. Yes. Um, so as I said two times a year, once once a year we get this massive amount of manuscripts uh, for the Catherine A. Morton Prize in six weeks, and um, yeah, on the allergy front, my eyes just are on all day. Um, okay, so the way we handle this is the manuscripts are all shipped to Saraband. Um, we get them in the mail. We get most of them right around the deadline um, and because people wait to the last minute for everything. Um, we are now doing half of this online um, at least and we'll probably be doing all of it online in the future. Um, but one person, the contest manager, logs in all the manuscripts both online and print. Um, and they are then um, split up into portions and sent out to readers. Uh, the poetry, we have four poetry readers. They end up reading about 250 manuscripts apiece. Um, they select um, five semifinalists. The five semifinalists um, go to us, Jeffrey and me. Jeffrey and I end up reading 30, 30 to 40 manuscripts in their entirety, and then we send 10 on to the final judge. Um, the final judge picks one, um, and we 
may or may not publish an additional um, manuscript from the, from the um, finalist group. Um, so what we're going to do is these poems are examples of the kind of poems that we receive. Um, we are going to divide the poems up and we're going to read them out loud first once. And you are going to vote yes or no. And um, you're going to decide whether this should be considered for sent on to the judge, for example, um, or actually be published at all. Um, just yay or nay. That's all I want you to do after we've read the poems. And mark it on your poem. Um, and then um, we'll read them again and we'll talk, we'll divvy up the vote, we'll um, tally up the votes, and then we will see how people voted. Talk about that vote and the poems themselves. I've do, I'm doing new poems every year, so this will be a new experience for me. Um, I did save some really bad poems just to make sure that the group was even here. We mm. had some good ones and bad ones. Um, so let's start with, um, you know, in the process of this, I can also talk about what appeals to me as an editor when I look at a poem um, and why I would want to publish something in the same way. Um, who would like to read the fence before? Volunteers? Fence? Okay. Out and alone on the endless empty prairie. The moon bathes me, the stars bless me, the sun warms me, the wind soothes me. Still, 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 I wonder. Will I always be out there? To the out here? Exposed and alone, will I ever know why I was put on this earth? Will somebody someday stumble upon me? Will anyone remember me after I'm gone? May I suggest that you not actually vote and you read all of the all yeah. the ones have been read? Just because you get a, a sense of context. Mm -hmm. you know? This is what I do too. <coughs> okay, that's the fence. Let's go on. Now I walk through this human boat for volunteers. Okay. <coughs> now I walk through this human built world. I remember you on the cold streets of Montreal a blonde buying chocolate in a French city full of synagogues. That was the year of the Upanishads, when love was universal. I know that you want to move someplace warmer now, but I have seen you in boots and gloves, with eyes glistening in your hair. It is too late for me to change. I am here, I am content, I am still at work. Now I walk through this human-built world, with my little bag of shopping and my dreams. Light is laid like a tablecloth across the afternoon and even the thinnest, purest saints will eat. Quietly, people leave their offices. Quietly, they cross the square, stroll through the park, heading home. There is nothing more to be afraid of. I hope that you will stay with me. I am happy, darling, even if I am lost. Being thrown bones, sometimes there's meat on them, most of them not. I have to sit up straight and beg a lot. Sometimes I run around in circles or grovel the floor, driven crazy by the smell, that lingering odor of life close to rot. Most days I cringe and whine. I put on mournful eyes to get what's mine until at last the bones come whirling through the air. I leap, I lick, I know on everyone, my master's share. My apology, there should not be a period at the end of one. That's a typo. Whistle. <coughs> 
Chicken war begins. Down the veins and blue leg fat. Scratch, I have a plate. Scratch. Chicken stars skinny, brown, I hold. My plate salt with grease and dirty chicken bones. I ate the yellow meat all from. Go ahead, says <coughs> uncle. Sure don't like to waste that sure. Don't like to waste that sure not me. <laughs> now my plate goes something white over the wire top. Look at them, says. Look at them. Look at them, says. Oh, that's that was dialect. Look at them, says. Uncle, look at how birds eat up that chicken. I look at how birds cat. Up. Oh, oh, eat up can't read that. I look at how birds eat up that chicken good. Got chickens I'll eat up. Chicken girl. Chickens will eat chicken girl best. Cover up those dirty legs. Really, really difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Yeah. I have I have <laughs> Uncle tips his plate into the chicken yard. Chicken war begins, down in the veins and blue leg fat. Scratch. I have a plate. Scratch. Chickens toss skinny brown. I hold my plate sogged with grease and dirty chicken bones. I ate the yellow meat all from. Go ahead, says Uncle. Sure don't like to waste that. Sure don't like to waste that. Sure not me. Now my plate goes, soft and white <clears throat> over the wire top. Look at them, says Uncle. Look at how birds eat up that chicken. I look at how birds eat up that chicken. Good. Or, I'm sorry. I look at how birds eat up that chicken. Good God. Chickens will eat up chicken, girl. Chickens will eat chicken, girl. Best cover up those dirty legs. Echo, the last one. Okay. What is the echo? What is the echo? Circles in a tristone mean? Is it years of time, decays of time, history, moments? It got ripples in a pound. What does it mean? Is it sound of space and her barriers of space being moved? What causes the echoes in life? <coughs> Does it sound strange? I know it sounds strange, but it sounds right to me. Unless mistakes are made, video is like unto water, and seeps into shrank, detested places, shines in its smallest pools, and alumni, and has no desires. How hard to identify with that. The virtuous does not know itself as virtuous. The great writer does not write. Okay, we have a wide range of poetry, styles, and um, quality. So um, give it a yay or a nay. Go back through and make your decisions now. Okay. How many should we choose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Being thrown bones. How many yes? How many no? I, I'm sorry, I only got, did someone not vote? about uh, a recognizable theme, death. Uh, it talks about us, everybody. So I guess this is why everybody looked for this book, because it's clear Not really. and neat and, and yeah, and easy to read and to follow. <coughs> That's it. Yeah. I would also vote because it's a very strong horror with construction. It's a little cold. Yeah. Musical. Yeah, it's very musical. musical. It just doesn't speak to me. <laughs> That's okay. Can you tell me why? I don't know. I just didn't find some things that I can associate with, or I just... It's, it's very difficult to say, but it just doesn't speak to me. Okay. You know, one more thing. The questions, the rhetorical questions that struck um, people, especially me, Questions which we'll ask from ourselves in the first place. Okay. I, I want just to say why I said uh, yes. It was just the, la the last one, which is, will anyone remember me after I'm gone? Just this part just kept me reflecting on, on the question. This, it's very interesting, the title and the balance between the interaction with nature, the where is the fence actually? And I mean, that started me thinking. And there's a very fine line of a fine balance between uh, the person reflecting on other people, which is coming back to the eye, and, and the person interacting with nature. So that, there's quite a bit of balance. I think the fence is the line between life and death, because this is really stated in the last 
two lines will anyone remember the after Amgar? I think the poem is a kind of a speculations on the existence of human beings on the earth, this earth and the transitional period between life and death. See, no, see, human the beings theory. in others' mind too. The fence yes. is I see, and when I am not there. The one at a time, please. Yeah. Talking over each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't. I just couldn't follow the. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sir. No, no. You said the uh, 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 this life on earth and death, but I'm also saying is uh, is that the life on earth and the continuance of life in other people's mind. So that that is also a fence there. It's yes. also split evenly between yeah. Roman and italic, so there's yes. a natural yes. dividing line. And then now, the first line says, out and alone on the endless empty prairie. <coughs> and then the last one says, will anyone remember me after I'm gone? Maybe away from the prairie too. Not from the line. Any other no's that are willing to defend their vote? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, some of the grounds on which this was defended, because they're quite exactly the things that I think make for bad poetry. Um, that is to say, not always, but generally speaking, language that is simple and clear is not mm -hmm. poetic to me. Language that's poetic has to have a little bit of density, a little bit of impact, a little bit, uh, not, not just impact, but a little bit of something for me to think about and work out and work over and, and something that hooks my mind rather than my just reading it and saying, oh yeah, you know. Um, I don't find anything original here at all. I do like the, the nouns, you know, I think moon and stars and sun and wind are nice nouns, but all the verbs that go with them are absolutely predictable and, you know, cliched to me. And I think the other thing is that the, that the last several lines of the poem are too self-pitying. Will I always be out here exposed and alone? You know, it's a little, you know, you can have those feelings, and we all do, but you have to find ways of expressing them that don't sound quite so, so, uh, so sorry for yourself. So, I really disliked this poem. I'm sorry, I'm a crank. Do you think poetry should be difficult in order to be good poetry? I think poetry has to have some, some, some interest in the language. Not the language is, is prosaic, but it's used over and over and over again. It's lost its currency. It also doesn't touch me. It also poetry isn't just about emotion. I love poems that move me, but there are other kinds of poems in the world too. You know, there are funny poems. Those are not poems that touch me. They, they are poems that amuse me. There are poems that scare me. They don't touch me. Um, the question with emotion is always, it seems to me, is not are the emotions uh, nice or compatible, but are they expressed in language that has an intensity or an impact or a, an interest that is something more than just, oh, I feel sad. That's familiar. Yeah. Well, I would, and it does have to defamiliarize to some degree to be art. Yeah. One of the things we look for when we read poetry is a voice, and a, a special voice, a voice that's unusual and that we haven't heard before. Um, you were saying that this really could appeal to anyone. The reverse is that it could be written by anyone, too. Um, it, it's, there's just no sense of personality here, um, and that's what we look for. I just no, and I just had to give the cranky version because everyone else was so positive with it. Yes. And, uh, and I knew she was looking for somebody to do that. So. But it's also a little bit of too sentimental, isn't it? Yes, that's that's the in a word that's the problem for me. Okay, now I walk through this human built world. Um, yeses on this one. Yes. Don't be, Don't be scared. <laughs> How about you, right here? Okay. 
uh, first uh, of all, I think, uh, see two parts in this poem, yes, and the first part, I, when I read it, I can imagine the situation and I draw the picture of uh, what is uh, told by the poet. And the second part, I think the first one is uh, realistic. She, uh, this part addresses to my realistic part. And the second part, as I see it, it addresses to my emotional part. I understand this person and I can read uh, emotions which are depicted in the second part. That is why I have chosen this poem. It has a lovely close, you know. I am happy, darling, even if I am lost. You know, that's, that may make it sound chills of Arya. Is, that, is this supposed to be a comma? No. I was also about to ask, is the period there I'm after I'm happy? I don't think it's there. I think that's... I'm happy. Th th it, that reads better. I'm happy, darling. And then sh th I think the she pause... did that on purpose. She wanted to slow the line down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Just to determine clearly that she was very happy. To... And then it says, darling, even if I'm lost, yeah. with all the fears, all the right. yeah, hopes and fears and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it starts from, um, I like those antonyms, cold and warm, because kind of it starts from cold, like freezing, what I sometimes feel here. <laughs> <laughs> That's my personal, like, and, and, and it moves us into some warm, deep feelings, you know comfort when you feel really comfort like that's what amazed me at first and I like this poem like at first and kind of very mm, bright visualized picture mm -hmm. um, like Montreal French city and all that and uh, I like France and I like it's connected for me it's associated with high style fashion like brands and later on in the poem it's mentioned like shopping you know I mean like it's not about shopping it's about that beautiful style and like fragrance of uh, France, you know, and all that Romantic. stuff. Yeah, romanticism, all those. So there's some sensual details in here yes, that help yes. us imagine. Yes, for sure. Draw the That's why I line. like yeah. this. The difference here about emotion, it seems to me, is that the emotion come, does come out of the concrete. You know, it comes out of the... I get a scene first. I get something very mm -hmm. specific. I imagine Montreal. And the emotion, and, a, and the emotion emerges out of very specific details. Yeah. Buying chocolate in a French city full of synagogues, and you know, full of synagogues, for instance, that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. I don't think of Montreal as a city full of no. synagogues. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't think of any city particularly as full of synagogues as such. That and that sort of changes my sense of the landscape. Why that detail? Yeah. There's something mm -hmm. intriguing. Pushing to think, yes. I also like those lines. That was the year of the Upanishads when love was universal. That she or he, the poet, just depicts or chooses specific things, really specific that we wouldn't think about. Mm -hmm. uh, can I say something? Sure. It, I don't know. When I read it um, the first time, I didn't really understand much. But the second time, I felt like it depicted very much. Uh, the life of immigrants, I, and in my country, a lot of people have moved to other countries, they immigrate, mm -hmm. and um, it, it kind, of, kind of narrates uh, much the feeling of the person who who has finally like adapted, mm -hmm. and who feels at home, you understand, who yeah, makes that his home, and, and, and then cannot let go of that, you understand? And, but there's this, um, how can I say, there's always this, a issue I mean, whether I mean I want to go or stay after I have actually like accumulated a certain wealth you understand and then I can go back and then live more comfortably but uh, what what he says is that I'm here and I'm home and I feel good I'm not afraid of what is what it was in the past okay and this is much what happens with many people I have met who have left the Dominican Republic, for example, and then they feel so good. And I don't know, it's kind of like evokes that in me. And the, the, the speaker admits mm -hmm. that she or he is lost, too, at the same time, at home and, at, and lost, and mm -hmm. it's a disassociation in place. 
Yeah. And how about this phrase, like, with eyes glistening in your hair, like, it's so unusual, right? And it's so romantic, and at the end, I, I like it, I'm happy. Like, which is not, every poem finishes in that, like, I, I'm da, I'm dead, I'm like, but here, I'm happy, you know? Uh, so it's, it's really perfect. <laughs> I love the lines, um, even the thinnest, purest saints will eat. Yeah, yeah. that's what yeah. I like about the yeah. poem. Okay. I think uh, his feeling is very real because um, he gave us the the real name of the city, and and you find it just sometimes you are just in uh, in the situation yourself, so you can feel the real feeling. I guess. Okay, that's my feeling. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we did publish that book. <laughs> Okay. This is my, my uh, idol and good friend, uh, Eleanor Roman, and this is, her, as I said, this is her fifth book. Being Thrown Bones. Um, oh, yes. A lot of no's. No, a lot of no's. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, I'm just out of curiosity, let's hear it from the nose first. From the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't understand it. You what? I didn't understand. Okay. For me, it was like very unauthentic voice of a dog or something. <laughs> <laughs> a duck? Dog. 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 Oh, yeah. Good for children's poetry. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really. I mean, uh, between say 11 and 15 or otherwise. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. I think it's too ordinary. I don't see any particular interest in in language in this. Just talking about bone and uh, using. I mean, the poet speaks on behalf of a of a, of a dog. So I don't see. It. Or it's the poet speaking metaphorically. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just simple for me. It smells badly. I mean, like there are many words just like uh, rot and order and like not pleasant stuff. That's what I like, felt mm -hmm. from here. Yeah. Like the sense of smell wasn't really pleasant. So that's what I said no. I think that's uh, no, what uh, they, he wants to look, uh, show his uh, way of thinking about the outer world. For him, the outer world is like in the dark forest, <laughs> for example. I voted yes for this poem because it's about human being again. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it reminds me of another text, uh, Life the Hound. Uh, life the dog, it comes at a bounce and it, it can attack you uh, without being conscious of a dog attacking you. Uh, well, at times it could be as meek and docile and uh, easy going as a dog. So, this is, you know, the two sides of life. It could threaten you, and it could, you know, uh, give you, feel like, a nice uh, face. This is what they got from this poem. That's it. But what new does it tell you about life? Sorry? What new does it tell you about the life? Poets about, uh, the poet's attitude towards the outer world. For him, it's the, like a... And our uh, human existence is like a dog's <laughs> life. Yeah. <laughs> and the recognition, I think, recognition that you were there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yes. put on mournful eyes to get what is mine. I've, uh, this is already mine, but I just don't look at it like it's in a happy. It doesn't, it doesn't mean to be happy with the outer world. Just, well, I just, just, one more thing, yeah. Uh, from a post colonial perspective, uh, the dog here. Could be the colonized. Oh no! <laughs> 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 oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the kid, the kid all along. Mm -hmm. oh, I've no. been thrown. I've been thrown things. I wouldn't like to be compared to a dog. To be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you wouldn't like that. Your the author feels like a dog. <laughs> but my my grandparents used to be colonized, and I wouldn't like them to be compared to a dog. <laughs> oh no! I think it's the poet speaking as a dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I get a little bit thrown my way every once in a while, and I feel okay, but I wish it were more. This yeah. is probably why I didn't understand the poem, because I, uh, my mind refused to think of it as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> it's also in rhyme. Yeah. 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 Y
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, to me, the, the topic is like overused a lot. I mean, I come from my from my context in which um, and there is a lot of like a left point of view. Like uh, there's a lot of opposition, and this is like too repeated in in, in uh, the Dominican Republic environment. Like uh, the powerful, and then the less powerful who is the dog. It's like very repeated. I didn't find anything like. Yeah. This, we, we are going to turn this around. It comes from, uh, and sent back and rejected. Um, it comes from a poet that I've published before named Dick Allen. And I, <laughs> and um, I thought that he was really sort of on autopilot writing this poem. Um, it's, part, it's a two-part poem called Humblings just about being humble, um, but I thought it was too cute and too sing-song. And finally, I really didn't even get the ending. I thought it was, I know on every one my master's share. Um, I, I just I just thought it was a silly. I thing. also, again, I think it's self-pity. It's self-pity, self yeah. Mm -hmm. I cringe and whine and people throw me a little scratch. Dick Allen doesn't have such a bad life. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He's been able to write. For 30 years by himself without teaching. Anyway, <clears throat> anyway the, uh, the title's terribly awkward and difficult to say. Being home bones. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> Different <place>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gristle, what were, how did we get on? Six and 13. Okay. Let's hear from the yeses first. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's on the gristle. Oops, I put yes. an yes with uh, the thing that I need to read it a little more. So a what the condition that yes, this is a poem that teases me, that makes me go back to it, and obviously there is a metaphoric level to it. It's not just literal. <clears throat> it cannot be. So uh, uh, that is that is where I, I thought that. It gives, it, it demands a second and a third look, and therefore a yes. Okay. But the, the question is, does it reward that second look? I think I'll need a little more time. I mean, okay. this is, yeah. Uh, but it, it does. It, uh, th this one and uh, uh, Now I Walk, I, I, I thought in this bunch to be the two best poems. I voted yes. Well, are we still with the yeses? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I was a yes. Okay. I think that the language is, I, I don't like all the line breaks, but I think the language is vivid and uh, interesting, and uh, I love uncle's voice. Look at them. And at the end, you know, the poem becomes metaphorical at the end. Mm. But it, it does so in a, to me a surprising and interestingly disturbing way. Yeah, yeah. Uncle takes chickens eating chickens as a way of explaining to the niece that she better be careful about her body. Mm. That, you know, that it will get, as it were, metaphorically eaten up. That she needs to, yeah. That she needs to look out for herself in a world yeah. in which animals eat their own kind. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think it's very. I mean, the whole notion that that this lesson is is here's what the world's really like, girl. Cover up your mm -hmm. legs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is pretty it's interesting pretty to strong me. One, yeah. Plus the fact ready. that it suggests that at the same time he's sort of telling her that she doesn't have very good legs. She got chicken legs. <laughs> 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 I didn't see that, but that's not over there. <laughs> so, you know, to me it's quite an interesting poem. Well, the, the, I think the line breaks and the details and the language, the sound of the language, really sets the scene beautifully. <laughs> you can see this backyard, you can see the fence mm. and these nasty animals eating chicken eating their own species mm -hmm. uh, with, with relish. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love this um, long line. Where is it? 
go ahead, said Uncle. Sure don't like to waste that. Sure don't like to waste that. Sure not me. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. That's beautiful. That's right. Sense of enchantment. Okay, so, so Harry, tell us why we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, uh, I find the dog image much more expressive than the chicken image. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, the poem is complex. Uh, I like, you know, the conversational tone and the dialogue, or if it could be called dialogue, but I couldn't see what is behind the chicken image uh, in a clear way, as I see it in the uh, in the dog, if you like, uh, poem. You see? That's it. <coughs> One of the things that's interesting about this exercise is that I think when people do this, when they're put on the spot to react to poems, the, they value intelligibility much more highly than they do when they're going to be teaching literature. If we, if we applied the same criterion to what we consider to be literature, The Wasteland would be a terrible poem because we, we don't understand it. And I think there's a, a really interesting conflict in all of us between the desire to understand and get it, and you know, uh, and, the work that it takes. and the desire to be um, in control of that. Well, between that and, on the other hand, the desire to be intrigued, to be forced to do more, and so forth. I know I have this reaction when I, especially when I first encounter difficult poems that I know I have to read. It's like, why can't it be a little easier, for God's sake, you know? Anyway, it's just an interesting thing that happens to us as readers about conflicting values that we have at the same time. And that's why second readings and third readings are so important mm -hmm. and why we go through this process when we acquire literature because uh, you can get through an easy poem and feel satisfied, but if you go back a second time, you think, well, what else is there? Um, whereas if you go take a difficult poem, you'll have multiple layers of meaning and um, inference and that reward the imagination, that reward the reward and so on. Yeah, so you took this. Uh, we did. She's actually a U of L faculty member. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How is it? Yeah. How did you think of it? I didn't know. But that's yeah, where I've heard it. This is her book. That's where I've heard it, yeah. Of course, I had forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. okay. I thought that book, I just had forgotten at that point. Yeah. I actually picked it because it's kind of disturbing and gritty and full of dialogue. And I love that kind of thing, too. Okay, Echo. <laughs> By the way, there are no typos in this poem. This mm. is the way it is. Mm. Not an echo, echo, a uh, echo. Yes, Did you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding echo, I mean, I uh, both, I mean, yes, because I find the, the way of telling of this uh, language by using cushions, what causes, it will make everybody has his reaction to contemplate, to think about this. Really, I admire it. Despite that, this is very short, we can say. Uh, but the language, it will make you think about uh, the meaning, what behind this line, what behind these questions. The questions, you think, the way of questions make everybody reacting. That's my opinion. Okay, so it sort of involves some engagement because of the questions. Yeah. Anybody else? You're a yes, right? Well, that's, that's I think... Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think there is a, a deeper meaning behind the simple words. Uh, they, um, and uh, let us think that um, there's something like echo in our lives. Uh, and, um, the, the ending is quite open and uh, you've got a lot, lot of possibilities and you can think what is the echo of our life. So can cause of us think about something. I think that's <coughs> deeper meaning behind uh, simple words. That's my big question. Yes. So these were yeses, yeah. yeah. I think this is really beautiful because it makes you somehow reflect about it's telling you about the the good and bad things that you've done and probably cause an impact in your life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're like and you learn you learned and you become better because you learn from those experiences, either good or bad. You become someone 
a little bit better, I guess. So this is like echo, what causes echoes in my life. All the good things I've done, all, all the bad things that I regret up to this moment. This was, I liked it. Nose? Uh, for yeah. me, the poem is too short <laughs> <laughs> to vote yes. If it were longer, maybe it would be slightly different. I liked some ideas of it, but as I said, if it were longer, so maybe my answer and what would, would be, be the different. advantage of making it longer? Um, I don't know, maybe like to elaborate on some things more. It would be Could I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's key. Could I add to her? Because it is short, yes, to, it is too short to to really say anything about these heavy words, decades of time, history, moments, like very, very heavy yes. words. That, that doesn't then, I'm very abrupt. Okay, I, you were say okay, I voted no, but then I changed my mind. <laughs> oh my! Right. 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 I think it needs to before you change your mind. Well done. <laughs> um, somewhere it leaves me where I started because it brings up an an issue and doesn't seem to give a way ahead. Echo. I think that's what she means by it's too short. You expect something more, and then you are left there. So the reader has to react. Yeah, let Karim. I, Karim, 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 Karim finishes. Right. I think it's too short. It's it's on purpose. I mean, literally, yes. in this yes. course, on the course there is nothing innocent. I mean, if if the speaker of the poem uh, brings it as such, then it he, he's got the meaning behind. And I think, you know, Echo here, again, you know, talks about the never-ending themes of life and death and time with capital T, even though it's not mentioned and yet it's there from line sure. one to line, the last line. And uh, here, uh, if you like, you know, the, the, the shortness of the poem is a metaphor for the brevity of life. That's it. Okay. I would also yes. say that it, it, it's also um, engineered to be uh, to be like that. I mean, the the, the the way that it is short, so that it actually like bounces back and keeps repeating. I mean, if, if you remember, I mean, when you're trying to produce echoes, I mean, long utterances or long sentences do not come back, only the short ones. I mean, I think this is for you to, like to think back and regurgitate it. You understand? Think back. So. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, Kareem, I I rejected this poem, but I went over it, and I think it is it is interesting, because the poem itself is full uh, full of elements of prosody, that are reminiscent of an echo. Um, you have a succession of long and short lines, and at the end, the final line, what causes the echoes in life, I. I think there's an echo there between causes and echoes. So finally, I, I think if we had to vote again, <laughs> I would be in favor of it. I'm going with your, ins your first answer. Um, yeah, this was a rejection. Um, if you go through this, I'm sorry. I can't find anything to like in this poem. I got one thing to like. What's that? <laughs> The notion that circles in a tree stump have something to do with, with echoes. echoes. Oh, that's that's cool. And that is the only physical image, really. Mm -hmm. I love the word heavy words. Yeah. Who said that? The question. Yeah, he heavy words, you know, big abstractions mm -hmm. that. Um, as opposed to Eleanor Lerman's poem, who had very specific details from a very specific place. So it has no information like that, and no sense of voice, no sense of location. Um, and it's not, it's terrible punctuation. I mean, look at the punctuation. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in Echoes, fact. Echoes, apostrophe S. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, you're not allowed to do that in poetry. <laughs> well, there's a difference between, between a, a choice that you make to deviate from the standard because you're using it as an, as an effect and what simply reads like grammatical incompetence, mm, yeah. which is what yeah. this poem reads like to me. Yep. For one thing, the plural of echoes is E-C-H-O-E-S. Mm -hmm. yes. you know? 
Just not fairly no reason to have the possessive thing. Yeah. Yes, mm. uh, this is my question. Does it happen that the spelling error, whether intentional or not, is accepted? We, we expect a level of professionalism in our writing. And this Two spelling but, but you could have a poem in which there were misspellings if mm -hmm. they were functional. Mm -hmm. If, for instance, you were writing in dialect mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, yeah. that, right. that were a like representation of dialect, yeah. you could certainly publish a poem with a misspelling. The question is whether you feel like the author is in control of the language at a, mm -hmm. at a basic level. And this poem... Seems like not. Not. <laughs> it was also written in handwriting. <laughs> Another tip off. Okay. Now that doesn't mean you couldn't discover something wonderful right. in such a poem. But it is off-putting to me as a reader from the outset because I think I'm this this is not going to be a good poem because this person can't control the language. Hmm. And even if we discover maybe five or six out of the whole um, manuscript that were really startling and evidence of raw talent, I wouldn't have the confidence in this writer to be able to fix the rest, rest, the rest of the book because there's just a basic misunderstanding of how English language works. So let's just look at the last one to close out. I know it sounds strange, but it sounds right to me. Um, can we have some just general discussion about this? Tell us how you voted in. Yeah. Well, uh, why I voted for this poem is not because I looked upon it as a literary reader, but as a journal reader. For me, it gives an ample amount of uh, eyesight into insight into the concept of virtue. That you 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 do not understand virtue unless you have made some mistakes. That's a very journal thing, but you know you you have to be reminded about that. And then um, the last two lines were like really nice to me because it's like a consciousness of a postmodern inhabitant that they are very conscious of their self-image. They portray themselves as they want to, but it's not always the case that if somebody is giving you an image that she or she is very virtuous, it's really the case. So it's like an insight into that. It's a yes, because the poem is uh, built on a central metaphor, a uh, simile. Virtue is like into water and seeps into shrine, blah, 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 all that stuff. So uh, it's much more complex than the poem we dealt with uh, before. It has the image of the pools, but here the pools are much more uh, visualized, if you like, uh, than uh, in, in, in the previous poem. That's it. Too laborious the title. <laughs> <laughs> the longest I one. Too <laughs> <laughs> laborious. Yeah, I'm not sure how it really it relates to the poem that much, mm -hmm. but it, it seemed arbitrary and kind of fine to go with it. I thought the last two lines were so mysterious and, yes. and interesting. <laughs> and, then, and then the use of the archaic or the biblical language, virtue is like unto water. Beautiful seats into shrunk to test your places. The idea that it could be virtuous if you were aware of other choices. Excuse me, please. After all this, uh, this discussion, which is really interesting and enriching, and it's a good exercise. <laughs> uh, I mean, you as a publisher now, do you expect poets? To be metaphysical, I mean, writing from that complex perspective, using interesting language and uh, complex metaphors, elaborate conceits, uh, or or to go back to the fans, simple English, basic ideas, basic images, perhaps used or overused. But what? Well, uh, we do not. We look for originality, and that means a sense of voice, a sense of personality behind the work. Um, but you look at, at this, um, uh, of the Charles Wright, by the way, this is Charles Wright. Um, here he's a really big deal in the United States. Um, and we were lucky to get this published. And this is virtue, I know it sounds strange. Right. right. Um, 
so, you know, yeah, voice. right, right. Um, you know, I go back to that sense of this combination of heart and mind, and the mind would not allow a poem with so many abstractions and so much prosaic language. Um, so that, you know, you just have to read a lot of poetry before you can get to the point in, that you can identify a good poem when you see it. Um, I know it intuitively now. Because I've been a poet since I was 21. But 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 I think part of the answer to your question is, it's not that we're looking for something deep and metaphysical. It's that we're right. looking for something that's not so abstract and mm -hmm. not so cliché. Uh, often the the worst poetry is poetry that, that people try to make deep and metaphysical. Right. And the you know the if you compare, for instance, the language of the fence to the language of now I walk through this human-built world. The language of the fence seems to me uninteresting because I've heard it a million times and it sounds self-pitying. The language of now I walk through this human-built world is interesting to me not because it's metaphysical, but because it's very specific. And because whatever ideas or feelings it has comes out of, come out of the specifics. <coughs> That's, and that's, when I teach creative writing, I am trying to teach people not to write like the fence and to write more like how I walk through this human built world. One of my exercises with young students is to give them an abstraction, like love or death, and not, and then explain the difference between that and cognitive marriage, and then tell them that they can write a poem about that subject, but they may not use any abstractions. They have to use just these little skinny words, these detailed words, these concrete words. And you'd be amazed how it, how it just these young writers simply blossom when they're given that specific instruction. Second Now, uh, another question. In the, in the collection of poetry, like this one, mm -hmm. uh, do you expect such a quality from every poem? Well, she certainly does from the one you're holding because it's her book. <laughs> I said published. I had to answer that one. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't well, think you I, no. um, Yeah, I mean, no, that, I would say probably 80% of the poems have to be really top quality. Or two thirds of the book, maximum, minimum. Um, and, you know, going back over my own books, you know, I don't. Yes, there are a few poems in some of those books that I really don't like anymore, and I never read. Um, so, not everybody can be 100% Anyway, this is a beautiful edition. We do these as well, where we combine art. Um, these photographs on the side with, um, this is actually Charles Wright's um, typescript. He uses an old-fashioned typewriter, a manual, and we just scanned his poems in, um, the originals, and he even has some editorial marks on it. And the, you know, the personality of the writer really just pops right out. He, he deals with abstractions. He's, he's almost 80, and he's facing his death. So, uh, but he does so in such a fresh way, and moving way. He's a wonderful writer. How do you select the images? And does the author also <laughs> somewhere? The cover, the cover is up to the author. They have to come up with an image. And we, um, most of the time, we allow them to use the image. But then we do the design. Um, that's worked out 99% of the time. Um, the inside, these were, we sent the poems to a young designer named Eric Appleby and had him come up with the images to go with the poems. And Charles Wright really loved them. So. And this, actually, the book was featured on McNeil Lehrer. News Hour. Um, Charles Wright was interviewed and he was reading directly from this book. The National News Show. National News Show. It's really exciting. Okay, so at two o'clock we reconvene and Sarah and Jeff will give us a reading. But for now, I think this is an extremely enlightening morning. Yeah. I always think that this really adds something wonderful to the program, and I think we ought to thank Sarah for this. Thank you all. This is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs>